Pop by name, but not by nature. That might make more sense as we work towards the conclusion of this review. I 100% intended for this to be a 15 minute review, but there were some small issues, some of which aren't strictly relevant to the end product, but I felt compelled to delve into. Keep an eye out for a reducing bar at the bottom of the screen that's tracking the duration of segments like that, so you can easily skip ahead if they're not for you using the right arrow on your keyboard or double tapping the right side of your screen. The testing and conclusion portions populate about a third of this video. Uh, this front panel alone was an enigma that I had to understand better. Does having it reduce more noise than its restriction to airflow that may or may not require higher fan speeds to compensate for, causing more or less noise? My testing has figured that out. Spoiler alert, you're probably better off on all counts without it. Anyway, that's enough busy work. I'll try and keep the mundane brief and accentuate the interesting. Please enjoy. Okay, so before we go any further, epic fail on the name. Uh, excuse the mini, that's manageable. Pop and silent. You can't have a pop that's silent, right? All right, brush past the name for a second. The reason I'm choosing the silent one is because there are so many cases on the market that are high airflow and perform great and all that sort of stuff. But getting a case that performs really well and is really quiet is a little bit more challenging. So I wanna see what they've brought to the table and uh, how it does compare to cases that are high airflow optimized. So crack this thing open and see how it does. Problem with the name, but by no means the problems with the packaging. It all seems perfectly adequate, so let's move on. Great job on the styling as far as I'm concerned. The slimmer lower basement facade does an excellent job of minimizing the bulk lower down while maximizing the fancy main compartment filled with the bulk of your cool looking components. Most of this uh, talking is actually just to show you what it looks like and give me enough time. Anyway, the front is also visually excellent in my opinion. And while the lower and upper panels don't match perfectly in texture or color, it's close enough until someone points it out. Sorry. Anyway, the main side panel is clear glass. Tinted glass does seem to be taking a back seat alongside RGB for that matter. Is it just me or are we moving towards cleaner looking cases again? Not really important. So moving on to the other side panel up front and technically part of the front assembly is a section of perforated steel that forms the main intake and filter for that matter for the case. Let's foreshadow the film performance results later and say this isn't irrelevant. Otherwise, the side panel is plain steel, nothing to write home about or complain about either. The same goes for the rear. It's a traditional layout with healthy ventilation around the PCI Express section, great for the graphics card, and an upper 120 mm fan position adjacent to the motherboard rear I.O. The base of the case is very basic. Nothing to see but the feet, the handle for the front panel, which takes a little digging to access when the case is upright, and the power supply unit filter, which is very easy to remove and replace. Up top, it's all sealed off to any hope of additional ventilation, but we have got a pretty slick front IO consisting of a power button, headphone and mic jacks, a couple of USB type A ports, 3.0 type A ports, and an unpopulated type C port. Maybe that's what the POP stands for. Getting inside this thing is easy. Not a lot to complain about. I'm still not a fan of the retained thumb screws though, but these ones aren't very offensive and seem to work most of the time without much fuss. Although after writing my entire script um, and replacing, removing and replacing all these panels a good few times, the steel side panels lower thumb screw, it just, it's, I don't know if the thread is all mangled up. I think the uh, retained thumb screw has got a little bit too used to pulling into the retained section a little bit too much. So it's just not functioning uh, the way a normal screw would. So yeah, close, but not amazing. Anyway, once unscrewed, the steel side panel doesn't just fall away uncontrollably, but instead rests on a linear angle built into the lower section of the panel. There's no way this thing is gonna fall off and take a chunk out of your desk unless you really wanted it to. The same effect goes for the glass side panel, only it's achieved with hooks and slots rather than that linear angle. Perfect marks for accessibility here. As for the front panel, like I mentioned a second ago, the handle for the front panel pretty much requires a lift of the front of the case to access, which is a touch awkward, especially for those who will be water cooling weight wise. And since this panel is held in place with those post and hole things that require quite the tug, 
What isn't awkward is the lower panel, which is housed in the main front panel. It's magnetically held in place, and there's a small tray inside. During this process, I discovered something I wish to talk about at the time. Please indulge my mild ramblings, as I think this is important to highlight. I can see a pattern emerging. Take 10, um, I'm, I'm battling between being concise and being thorough, and it's a battle that always or concise always loses. So when I was uh, taking off these panels and explaining the inner workings of ooh, this sort of stuff and nice, nice little draw in there, it's not really a one finger operation is when it goes back. Nice little cubby hole, little draw there so you can throw things like uh, USB dongles and, and flash drives and wireless adapters and little cables and stuff like that. Great for, for neat people, not neat freaks, that's not very nice. Neat people, love that stuff. I like it too, uh, and I'm not a neat person, you see my desk. Not the point. The point is, I put this face side down here, kind of my fault, but not really, for what I'll say in a second, and this occurred. Now, something's happened between either some junk from the case has fallen on the table, which was wiped before, so it wasn't existing on the table before the review started, so some junk from the case has landed on the table, or I've managed to transfer some junk from somewhere else and it's landed on the table. Now, what's concerning is between the weight of this panel and the hardness of whatever small grit granule or grain of whatever that's caused that it's managed to cause this scratch and it's a scratch that's deep enough to have its own shadow from the indent and I can feel it when I rub my nail lightly across it you can feel that little indent so this to me is concerning because this is becoming a trend with fractal cases now uh, the fractal design torrent cases or torrent compact one I reviewed the top actually had its own protective layer or film, extra protective film to protect the softness of the finish. This, I'm surprised this didn't come with it either because this is soft and it's just so easily scratched. Just so easily scratched. Now, yes, you can say, well, you shouldn't put things face side down, but I don't subscribe to that way of thinking. I think make something robust enough to last so that the chances of it getting damaged are low uh, as you know compared to pretty high in this regard like imagine if you accidentally dropped a screw and the screw just shaved past here you don't you're going to get a scratch and that's there forever you get the right light or the wrong light and you're going to see that every time it'll fade in you won't notice it here and there but what won't fade in are the smudges of my fingers on here it just picks up so badly on this but anyway so I'm not liking it. I'm, see I'm seeing it in the torrent compact cases or the torrent cases. I'm seeing it in this. I want to go back to the days where Fractal Design made cases like, and I think I've mentioned this three times in the last four videos, the Define C, bring back the Define C, and it's brushed aluminium effect plastic front panel. It wasn't just the brushed aluminium effect meant that if you scratched it, you could either blend it back in or it would blend in itself because it's all scratchy scratchy. It's the fact that the plastic they used was hard. It was a hard plastic. So it was of a hardness that wouldn't scratch easily. You could, you could rack your nails back and forward against it. I think I did when I did a video about it and it wouldn't, it wouldn't show a mark. It was great. This though is horrendous. You put one, one mistake. That's all it takes is a mistake. Now, if you're a mistake-free person, well done. But unfortunately, um, I'm human, so I don't get that benefit. So mistakes happen, such as putting it face down, upside down accidentally for a few seconds. So anyway, that is my bit on this. And this is bad design. Frack. Maybe that's why they dropped the design. But that's not the end for the lower front panel section. Sure, the delicate finish is a problem, but these aren't just two slots for some trinket tray. They're five and a quarter inch bays for anything from disk drives, which would nuke the respective three and a half inch drive behind it. So yeah, or one of those really cool five and a quarter inch bay fan controllers or anything in between that can fit in one of these bays. Since we're in the case, before we move on to the build, I want to draw attention to the acoustic lining more. All in all, we've got acoustic lining to the inside face of the front panel, steel side panel, and the top of the chassis. What's interesting is they've decided to use a very dense and heavier lining to the front and side panels, but the lining to the top of the chassis is very low density foam-like. 
I'm no acoustician, but I know enough to understand that different wavelengths of sound react differently to different material densities. Also, very dense materials or denser materials are great at preventing sound breakout from passing through to a different space, containing them in the case, and mid to low density materials or the right density to suit the predicted wavelength uh, are great at taking the energy out of the wave by converting it into heat by being moved by the wave. Not, not much heat, we're just talking the reduction in the energy from the wave, which isn't significant in this context at all. So, the side panels are reducing the sound from breaking out of the case, and the top panel is taking the energy out of the sound, depending on the wave, as it's being contained by the heavier side panels. Now if done properly, these linings will be set up to deal with the typical frequency range of case fans, and likely, if done properly correctly, the frequency range of the case fans provided. Anyway, enough of that, let's do a quick run through and you can consult the border, which will occur, I guess, around me now actually, uh, for more information on the specs of the case. The power supply install was uneventful, but the rubber pads are in nice touch and the option for fan side up is nice to have. Remember, if you think fan side up is a problem of any significance, you're wrong. Likewise, the motherboard install was very clean and the center, po center standoff post and pre-installed standoffs were helpful. Note, this is the mini version of the case up to micro ATX boards. There is a standard pop silent for up to ATX boards and a pop XL silent for up to E ATX boards up to 280 millimeters with varying drive support throughout. The CPU cooler clearance is very strong at 170 millimeters, which I was gonna complain about and say they could reduce it to 160 to save 10 millimeters of width, but frankly, that 10 millimeters means you've got enough space for real showcase coolers like the NHD 15, Darkrock Pro 4, you name it, you can probably squeeze it in. The drive installation was very simple. I was gonna say, I think it's really weird how we keep seeing lots of different ways to mount three and a half inch drives in cases, but all of them achieve pretty much the same outcome. But then I remembered that they correspond to the five and a quarter inch base to the front, which is pretty good if you ask me, some actual innovation in the PC case space. Imagine that. But wait, there's more. You can install the three and a half inch drives in the higher side slots and install a two and a half inch drive below it. Color me impressed. This is great. Anyway, the two and a half inch drive install into the dedicated panel was just as simple, nothing to write home about, but you can install the bracket in either the back or the top of the basement shroud in the main compartment. Nothing of note to mention about the graphics card install. I still don't understand why heavier thumb screws are used here when the same screws as the power supply unit could be used, but hey, I'm just the end user that sees no benefit. What do I know? Cable management is something that's always worth talking about and in this case, it's good. I didn't feel restricted in any way. The included Velcro straps were useful, and overall, the pockets of space in the basement and depth behind the motherboard tray made it a really easy experience. However, I especially didn't appreciate the way that they routed the rear fan cable. When I was swapping the stock fans out for my test fans for further testing, I found out they'd formed a tiny tab that was clamping down on the fan cable and clamping down hard. To remove it, I had to bend the steel out of the way with a screwdriver. Granted, this does make controlling the cable easier, slightly more visually appealing if you're laser focused on it, but it also is really hidden out of the way in a dark corner of the case. So when I was trying to remove it, I thought I'd caught the cable on the rear IO somehow and was slightly concerned I may have caused some damage when I was carefree pulling the fan out of the case. I think it's a fine inclusion as long as you know it's there, but I haven't worked with a case that's done this before in the past, nor have I thought something like this was needed ever. It feels more risky than useful, as in someone could inadvertently damage their rear fan if they weren't expecting it and they weren't handling their fan carefully enough to account for it. But lastly, since it's clamping down, it's not like it's something you're gonna use again with your fans, since your big old CPU cooler is right in the way and after a few folds back and forth, it's gonna weaken and break after a handful of cycles or so. Not that you're gonna use it a handful of cycles or so, but just a point I'm saying. It's in the right ballpark, it just needs tweaking to make it the end user experience better. Speaking of which, I'd really like to know how the internal testing for these design ideas work. Do they actually have time to test these things or do they just have to cross their fingers and hope for the best sometimes?
Speaking of fans, what you get here are three 120mm 1200rpm fans. They're quiet fans, so there's no risk of too much noise as far as I'm concerned, and I wouldn't necessarily see a need to change them, more on that later, but they're only 3-pin fans, which means they're DC controlled, which typically means that they have a, a lower RPM limit, so the lower, the lower RPM is, is higher than, say, a, a PWM controlled fan. But I don't think that's much of an issue due to the quiet nature of this case, which, again, we'll discuss soon in the performance section. As for the parts box and manual, there's nothing much to say about the parts box or bag in this case. You get what you need, but I'm not a fan of the zip ties. I'd much prefer to see an additional small length of Velcro that can be cut to whatever length the user requires. I always use 10mm wide Velcro straps for everything. It's like, yeah, if I was going to recommend anything for your build, 10mm wide Velcro strap is great. Anyway, so much better than the zip tie, but granted it is relatively more expensive. As for the manual, I didn't need to consult it at all during this build, which was nice. That shows that the design is at least intuitive to a relatively experienced builder. Otherwise, it's well presented and easy to follow. I haven't fact-checked it like I have done with other fractal manuals in the past, which have previously come up with inaccuracies or just issues. Actually, scrap that. Skimming through, uh, I'm finding all sorts of oddities, weird notes. For instance, the, in the GPU length under all-in-one water cooling build, it says 267 millimeters, but up to uh, 310 millimeters with a front radiator installed. Uh, why would the clearance increase with a front radiator? It might be an interpretation issue of mine. I'm not the sharpest knife in the head, but it sounds wrong. It could be easier to read it if it said 267 millimeters with a front radiator and 310 with without a front radiator or something like that. On the other side, under air cooling, it says 267 millimeters for GPU length clearance, but then says up to 340 millimeters is possible. How is it possible? What assumptions am I am I supposed to be making about that? How it's possible? Your car can drive up to 300 miles in one tank but 500 is possible. Do I need to just drive more efficiently? Do I need to take the seats out to reduce the weight? Is it theoretically possible if I just fill up to the equivalent of one tank along the way in, in intervals to save weight? I mean, what? Uh, spell it out to me so that I'm on the same page as you. Treat me like I'm someone who doesn't know what you're talking about. Oh wait, uh, it's the same BS that they pulled before. What these diagrams are, are examples of, of builds to show a potential setup and the primary specs, the initial numbers, are relative to the example with actual limitations in the brackets. But they do the bracket thing for the, don't, they don't do the bracket thing for the drives for some reason. So it's not consistent. So the graphics card model they have in this image is 260 mil, 267 millimeters long but you could go up to 310 millimeters with a front radiator installed. Why? Why do it like this without explaining clearly that this is an example and the primary measurements are relative to the example, not the limitations of the case? Just why overall? Show an example, sure, but if you're gonna state anything, only state the limitations, so max this or min that, or maybe throw in some dimensions so someone who wasn't in the same meeting room you were in when you came up with this system knows what you're on about. Side note, in the architecture world, we throw dimensions on all drawings to ensure what we're proposing is correctly interpreted by planning consultants and contractors, even though they probably know more about construction than, say, I do. We'd especially throw in some dimensions and a clear legend, which is not missing entirely in this case, if we were at all concerned that the receiver of the drawing might not be up to speed on the project, let alone the discipline. Seriously. How is a new builder with no prior experience of anything to do with computers, the, the kind of person who might consult the manual, supposed to assume that the top profile of the CPU cooler is that of a 159mm tall cooler without explicitly being told it's relative to the cooler model, which isn't mentioned anywhere. I don't even know what the, this cooler is. I, I looked at a Noctua NHD15S, it looks pretty close, but that's a 160mm cooler and has a different fin shape. And they specifically said it's a 159mm tall cooler. So I looked through the entire catalogue of coolers from 158mm to 160mm on PC Part Picker and even the ones that aren't on sale right now, and I still couldn't tell what cooler model it is. 
yes, you can work through the puzzle, but if someone who knows about this stuff, you know, myself, I've done a few videos on cases, is getting confused, I feel sorry for the new builder who just wants to know what the limit of the case is and trust the almighty fractal design, you know, they design cases, is going to spell it out to them and, and spell it concisely and consistently. Is it 159 millimeters or 170 millimeters? Yes, there's a CPU cooler clearance like limitation section, but even that can be misinterpreted since it looks like the same cooler as in the examples earlier, but there's no reference to 159 millimeters now where there was previously. And now the dimension is saying 170 millimeters from the bottom to the top of that, that little diagram. So little 3D view, what even is this? It should be consistent. All the information should, should be consistent and consistency is key. And Christ, could someone please find the office of the person who put the, who put the water cooling and graphics card limitation sections together, find their desk and fill all the gaps in their keyboard and mouse with glue. It won't stop them, I know, but at least it will slow them down long enough to think twice about using an arbitrary color scheme without a proper legend. If blue means pop mini air and gray means essentially both, or not, who knows, then why on earth would you suggest placing the fans for the silent version within what is essentially an already restricted duct, but then have the length of the card limited to the pop mini as recommended fan position relative to its graphics card position. Like honestly, this would all make more sense if they just hadn't bothered with colors and just maybe put some text in or some annotations. I could go on, but I'm scared I'll find more problems and this video will be longer than your average football game, including all the time everyone spends falling over. Will any of this make any difference? No, but I wouldn't be happy if I didn't point out how confusing this is relative commenters, please take this home, relative to how simple it could be. Anyway, let's do the performance stuff. The testing of this case was a little complicated. For a start, the noise output of the system with the CPU cooler and graphics cards fans running at their fixed testing speeds and the case fans running at full speed was so low that they didn't meet the relatively low noise output for the acoustically uh, normalized or limited testing, uh, which is the second type of test I do. When I say so low, it was one decibel or dBA lower than the 37.5 dBA target, so it wasn't entirely silent, uh, but the target isn't exactly noisy. It's a reasonable middle ground. So while I was able to do my stock full speed testing that doesn't rely on noise output, uh, I just measure the noise output, I don't normalize for it, I, I did in the end have had to go out and swap the stock 1200 RPM fans out for my slightly faster 1500 RPM Noctua NFF12 fans to perform the acoustically normalized testing, which I wouldn't normally do for a case that comes with three fans. The test fans are the last resort. Anyways, it's clear that the stock fans with the front panel in place are quiet even at full speed. So I wanted to know how the case performed thermally like that, but I also wanted to know how it performed with the fans at full speed without the front panel and how they performed without the front panel but with the fan speed limited to match the acoustic output of the fans at full speed with the panel on, if that makes any sense. So this should mean that we'll be able to fully understand the acoustic and thermal implications of the front panel. And since I swapped the stock fans out for my test fans, we'll also throw those stats in to compare just relative to the case, and then we'll take the relevant results to compare to other cases out just after. So let's get into it. Question one, does the front panel significantly impact thermal performance? Absolutely. In priority five, the difference in CPU temps from the 100% case fan speed tests with and without the front panel was roughly 15 degrees and 10 degrees for the lighter fire strike load. The GPU temps are a little misleading here since it was down clocking after like 55 degrees. So uh, I used to show clock speed, but then it made the graphs too complicated or just there were just too many graphs and now there's not enough information without it. So I may, may end up reverting back to clock speeds again. Maybe separate CPU and GPU performance, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll just see. Anyway, comparing the 100% case fan speeds with and without the front panel is also misleading since without the front panel, the system as a whole was 1.5 dBA louder. So if we reduce the case fan speed without the front panel to match the noise output of it with the front panel at full fan speed, we have a noise normalized setup that we can more confidently directly compare. 
What I found out through this was that the fans had to be turned down to 65% fan speed or on average 835 RPM compared to the full speed 1175 RPM to match those the, the noise output with the front panel on at full speed. <sighs> And at that matched noise output, the CPU was running 10 degrees cooler at full load with Primality 5 and 6.4 degrees cooler at the roughly 60% load with Firestrike. So that's a ridiculous difference. Taking a step back for a moment, this is actually insane. And yeah, I'm going to be a little hyperbolic since we don't get any filtering without the front panel but with the front panel that's sealed off to prevent noise escaping, the system ends up running significantly hotter. So hot, it crashed on one of the runs due to runaway CPU temps, and you have to run the fan significantly faster to achieve the poor result. Like seriously, if you want an even quieter system, you can achieve the same thermal result as you would with the front panel, but you could just rip the panel off and it turned, then just like turn the fans down even more to probably like 30%, which would be even quieter than the noise normalized ones I was doing. Now, this isn't exactly a new discovery, but the point is worth pressing. If you want a quieter case, you're probably better off going for the airflow version of this case, turning the fan speeds down and enjoying the better thermal performance and or a quieter system. Like seriously, just because some marketing uses the word silent, it doesn't mean that you need to take it at face value. Anyway, you may have noticed the plus 2F and plus 1R on one of the sets of the results, and that's the set of results where the stock fans were replaced for faster test fans, and they will run to match the noise output required for the noise normalized testing. So let's take the stock results and those noise normalized results forward to compare to other cases that were run under the same testing standards. As expected, in the stock full speed test, the POP Mini Silent sits on top of the two systems that fail to complete their runs. The O11 Dynamic Mini and the Helios both crashed during their Priority 5 runs, and the POP Mini Silent only crashed on one of the Priority 5 runs, so there's an improvement. But otherwise, temp-wise, it's a disaster. It is really quiet though, pretty much as quiet as the system with no case fans like the O11 Dynamic Mini, but it barely performs better. Let's move on then to the acoustically limited or normalized testing. Here I change the stock fans for my test fans to meet the critical 37.5 dBA target. Even producing the same noise level as all the other cases, it's still woefully inadequate in its thermal performance. Every other case above this one can either perform stronger thermally or acoustically, and likely both if, if you tweaked either setup specifically to meet a certain result. Anyway, it would be a waste of my time and your time to focus on this anymore, so overall, according to the spreadsheet, it gets a 6.7 out of 10 for thermal performance, and that's not bad. Actually, that's just really bad. That Why is that so high? I mean, the thing sucks. Okay, it turns out that there was a small issue with one of the data points driving the formulas in the spreadsheet. I haven't automated the max and minimum data points to compensate for the failed runs. I've just been letting percentile formulas handle it. So it's been taking some information from the failed tests, which was skewing the max and minimum values that all the point systems were driving off. So I've gone through and semi-manually fixed this. The increased accuracy hasn't screwed up with the high scores as much as it has rework the lower scores. So the Fractal Mini Pop Silent the third is now a five out of 10, not 6.7 out of 10, which is much more reasonable. But more importantly, the terrible Contour Helios is at 0.9 when it was at 2.1, which as far as I'm concerned is completely reasonable. That thing was pants. Anyway, let's get this bus of a review over the line with a conclusion. All in all, relative to the volume of the case and the market, the specification of the Pop Mini Silent is all right. It's fairly balanced across the board, and it's mainly lacking in radiator and fan compatibility since the top is blocked off. It does come with a handful of good fans though, so with the fan bonus score, which still needs nerfing, I know, it does pretty well relatively. The build quality is overall pretty good, just a small letdown with the finish and the glass thickness is average at 3mm, but that's not bad, it's fine, there's no problem with it. The installation ease is by far the best part about this case. That might sound weird and it sort of is to sort of focus on, but when I was running through the checklist to score this case on installation ease, I couldn't find many issues to complain about apart from the retained thumb screws, which 
aren't bad for retained thumb screws, but they, they still are retained thumb screws, so they're sh so all in all, this gives the Pop Mini Silence a 7.3 out of 10. It's getting a bonus quarter point for the nifty five and a quarter inch drive cage and tray design. I really like it, but it's not worth a whole bonus point, just a quarter. The main drawbacks are the overall spec and thermal performance, but it's being carried by the build quality and especially the installation ease. Price wise, this is an expensive case. For pretty much the same price, you can get the NZXT H510 Flow nowadays, and for less, you can get the Landcool 215. The 011 Dynamic Mini used to be a little cheaper when it was launched, and the MSRP should be cheaper, but it seems to be more expensive than $100 now, but it's still kind of within the ballpark. So if we take that and mash it with the final score to get a price versus score figure, it's about on par with the 011 Dynamic Mini and H510 Flow. Now, scores are great but the devil is in the details so if you're seriously looking at this case and you're going to be using hot components as in you're going to be getting the high-end pricey ones or you're looking to overclock some better value kit or, or overclock high-end pricey stuff that or you just know what you're using is going to need strong cooling just don't bother i don't mean this this that this case is bad not at all it, it's just not set up to fully support a high performance system mid to low end stuff Absolutely. If you're not going to push your system, sure. But if you need this look, maybe check out some reviews for the Air version and hopefully that will serve you better. <sighs> so there we go. That was a long review. I mean, I know just recording this thing, it was, it was a long ways. But I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it above all else, I hope you found it useful. If you do want to support me, honestly, the best thing you can do is to like the video, to share the video, um, to subscribe to the channel. Those are the absolute best things. You comment down below. Those are the best things you can do because I really need a lot of channel growth right now and uh, that's most important. If you want to support me even further than, than doing those things, then you can support me on Patreon. Throw a dollar or two my way. A huge thank you to the current supporters on Patreon that have been uh, actually around for a long time. Very dedicated guys. Uh, they really want to see the channel grow, as do I. Uh, I'm going to stop there because I think I've lost... Um, probably like a litre of my boy, a litre of my weight and sweat. Um, I have to lock off all the windows because acoustically that it's just so loud. So yeah. Anyway, first world problems. Thank you so much for checking this one out. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, let me know if you want to see anything different and I'll catch you in anything different, any other stuff in the future, um, anything specifically, and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye-bye.